Hi, everyone. We have not met last week after our first exam, which was February 10. And also, we couldn't meet this week because of the bad weather. So I'm going to go over chapter five today um, to record this uh, chapter lecture for you and also chapter six after this one. So let me share my screen and we will go over chapter five, which is about the planning and decision making. So this is what we are going to discuss today. So planning is choosing a goal, developing a method or strategy to achieve that goal. So we all have a short-term, long-term planning uh, to accomplish something. Um, some people are natural planner. They love it and can only see the benefits of planning. However, others dislike planning and uh, can only see its disadvantages. So planning has advantages and disadvantages. We are going to discuss this uh, in this chapter. So when you look at the chapter, you read the chapter in detail, you may see these advantages and disadvantages. First, managers uh, and employees put forth great effort when following a plan. Research, on the other hand, shows um, that uh, one with a specific plan will work harder. Uh, second, planning leads to persistence. That is working hard for long periods. In, uh, in fact, planning encourages persistence even when there may be little uh, chance of short-term success. The third benefit of planning is direction. The plans encourage managers and employees to direct their persistence effort toward activities that help accomplish their goals and away from activities that do not. So the fourth benefit of planning is that it encourages the development of task strategies. After selecting a goal, it is natural to ask, how can it be achieved? Finally, perhaps the most compelling benefit of planning is that it has been uh, proven to work for both companies and individuals. Companies with plan have larger profits and and grow much faster than companies they don't. Plans won't fix all organizational problems. The first pitfall of planning is that it can impede, change, and prevent or slow. The first disadvantage or pitfall of planning is that it can impede, change, and prevent or slow needed adaptions. So the second disadvantage of planning is that it can create a false sense of certainty. However, all plans are based on assumption, assumptions. So the third pitfall of planning is the detachment of planners. Detachment leads planners to plan for things they don't understand. Plans are not meant to be abstract theories. They are meant to be guidelines for action. The first step in the planning is to set goals. Goals need to be specific and challenging to provide a target for which to aim and a standard against which to measure to success. Managers and workers must choose to commit themselves to a goal. So how can managers bring about goal commitment? 
rather than assigning goals to workers, managers and employees choose goals together. The goals are more likely to be realistic and attainable if employees participate in setting them. Another technique for gaining commitment to goals is to make the goal public. Another way to increase goal commitment is to obtain top management support. Top management can show support for a plan or program by providing funds speaking publicly about the plan or participating in the plan itself. As you can see from this slide, for an effective goal, the goal must be specific, measurable, and then attainable, realistic, and timely. So an action plan, the specific steps, how, who, what, and when for accomplishing a goal, like people, resources, time period. The fourth step in a planning is to track progress toward the goal achievements. There are two accepted methods of tracking prog progress. First is to set proximal goals and distal goals. Proximal goals are short-term goals or sub-goals. Distal goals are long-term or primary goals. So the idea behind setting proximal goals is that they can be more motivating and rewarding than waiting to achieve far off distal goals. So the second method of tracking progress is to get it and provide performance feedback. Frequent performance feedback allows workers and managers to track their progress toward goal achievement and make adjustments in effort, direction, and strategies. The last step in developing an effective plan is to maintain flexibility. So one method of maintaining flexibility while planning is to adapt an options-based approach. So the goal of options-based planning is to keep options open by making small, simultaneous investments in many options or plans. Option-based planning is the opposite of traditional planning. The purpose of an action plan is to commit people and resources to a particular course of action. However, the purpose of options-based planning is to leave those commitments open. Holding options open gives you choices and choices give you flexibility. Another method of maintaining flexibility while planning is to take a learning-based approach. Learning-based planning assumes that action plans need to be continually tested, changed, and improved as companies learn better ways of achieving goals. Learning-based planning not only encourages flexibility in action plans, but it also encourages frequent assessment and the revision of organizational goals. Top management is responsible for developing long-term strategic plans. Strategic planning begins with a purpose, statements, and strategic objectives. A purpose statement is statement of a company's purpose or reason for existing. So in another word, it is a mission statement the reason the company exists. Purpose statement should be clear and consistent with the widely shared company beliefs and values. So strategic objectives are more specific goals that challenges the organization and processes a finish line and a time frame. Middle management is responsible for developing and carrying out technical plans to accomplish the organizational missions. Technical plans specify how a company will use resources, budgets, and people 
to accomplish specific goals within its mission. Strategic plans and objectives are used to focus company effort over the next two to five years. Technical plans and objectives are used to direct behavior, effort, and attention over the next six months to two years. Management by objective is a management technique often used to develop and carry out technical plans. So management by objectives, presented by MBO shortly, is a four-step process in which managers and their employees discuss possible goals, participantly select goals consistent with overall goals, jointly develop technical plans, and meet to review progress toward accomplishment of those goals. Another management group is called lower level managers, which are responsible for developing and carrying out operational plans. So these plans direct the behavior, efforts, and priorities of operative employees for periods running from 30 days to six months. The chapter also talk about kinds of operation plans, such as single use plans, uh, standing plans, and budgets. Single use plans deal with the unique one-time only events. Standing plans save managers time because they are created to handle frequently recruiting events. There are three kinds of standing plans. Policies, procedures, and rules and regulations. Budgets are the third kind of operation plans. Budgeting is quantitative planning because it forces managers to decide how to allocate money to best accomplish company goals. Decision making is another important function for managers, which is the process of choosing a solution from available alternatives. Managers define problems, evaluate alternatives, and choose optimal solution that provide maximum benefit to their organizations. The first step in decision-making is identifying and defining the problem. Decision criteria are the standard used to guide judgment and decisions. After identifying decision criteria, the next step is deciding which criteria are more or less important. The next step is to identify possible courses of action that could solve the problem. The idea is to generate as many alternatives as possible. The next step is to systematically evaluate each alternative against each criteria. This step can take much longer and be much more expensive than other steps in the decision-making process. The final step in the decision-making process is to compute the optional decision by determining each alternative's optional value. To make decision about problems, managers must be aware of the gap, be motivated to reduce the gap, and have the knowledge, skills, abilities, and resources to fix the problem. In identifying decision criteria, you have to have standards used to guide judgments and decision. The more criteria a potential solution meets, the better that solution should be. After identifying decision criteria, the next step is deciding which criteria are more or less important. The chapter discuss about two methods, which are absolute and relative comparison. As you can see from this slide, absolute comparison and the relative comparison. We are going to discuss these two methods today. The first one, the absolute comparison, look at each criterion and compare this criterion 
to a standard or ranked on its own merits. For relative comparison, each criterion is compared directly to every other comparison. This slide gives you an example about a relative comparison in this slide. So the home characteristics we are looking for are listed here on the left column. And then each column represents the importance of criteria. So for example, daily commute is like important for person is planning to purchase a house. And uh, other criterion, the characteristic of the home, the age of the building, quiet street, school system, quality, you add them up to see which one is more important. According to this slide, daily commit in grad pool, sunroof, quiet street, newly building house, etc. And then the total is five. You can see the second method is absolute comparison. Highlighted numbers in this chart, in this table, indicate how important a particular criterion is to hypothetical car buyers. So here we are looking how a car buyer make a decision by using absolute comparison methods. So for example, here in the first, the characteristics of cars are listed, and then the buyer is ranking from one to five, the importance of the characteristics. For example, owner satisfaction is ranked number two and predicted reliability is five, which is critically important. And for the avoiding accidents, it's important. In this table, as you can see, the importance of criteriums are listed from completely unimportant to critically important from one to five. For example, predict reliability is critically important. Predicted depreciation is completely unimportant for this type, this type of buyers. Front seat comfort, for example, is critically important for buyer and acceleration is completely unimportant for this particular buyer. In the decision-making process, managers need to generate alternative courses of action. This means that the idea is to generate as many alternatives as possible. We have to evaluate each alternatives. This step can take much longer and be more expensive than other steps in the process. Then for the compute thing, the optional decisions, we multiply the rating for each criterion by the weight for that criteria. Then we sum the scores for each alternative course of action.